There we go. I, uh, I tried to go live on the wrong page. Whoops. Uh, so Gracie and I went camping last night and uh, up in Cloudcroft. And uh, we were real bummed because we get there and they say no camping. And uh, I mean, no fires. We get there and they say no fires. And we're bummed out because we're like, well, this is going to be kind of a, a long, cold night then. And uh, then as we're there, we've already accepted our fate of just being cold. And as we're there, the ranger comes by and takes the sign off and, and he says, hey, you can have a fire now. I'm like, so we go to scavenge for wood and all of it's wet. <laughs> so it took me forever to light the fire. And, you know, hour after hour, I'm, I'm getting all, you know, upset. Finally get a good enough fire going. But I mean, you know, you have to, when you're using, you're, when you're using wet wood, you have to ro keep rotating it because... You know, like, uh, you have to put it on where it'll dry out so that then you can use it at a certain time. So you have to kind of space out and everything. And uh, finally, it, it, it's late, and I'm just like, okay, well, we have fun with the fire, but, you know, I'm just not going to stay up because this is just so much work and all this. So we get up in the morning after it has rained throughout the night. All of our stuff is wet. Everything in the campsite is, is wet. And the fire is still going. I couldn't believe it it took me forever to get that stupid fire going and you know and and then using wet wood and then we wake up and it's still going that ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, shouldn't have gone to bed should have just stayed up with the fire um and i blew on it a couple times and flames sprang forth and i was like really that has nothing to do with anything that we're going to talk about uh in the devotional for today I just want to let you know, uh, camp, uh, if you are planning on going camping, um, they have lifted the fire restrictions, at least in Lincoln. I don't know if that's, like, statewide or whatever. But anyways, um, so I was reading in, in Luke. Don't tell anybody about that. Uh, I was reading in Luke this week, and I, and I saw something that I never saw. Y you know, uh, I, I used to go to a church that was very uh, legalistic back when I was a kid. And it gave me insight on what it is to be a part of a church that cares more for rules and regulations and doing everything perfect than people. A lot of people maybe don't have that experience. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people do have that experience. And uh, so I, I was reading Luke 15, and I, and I saw something that I'd never seen before. And so I'll read that, okay, starting verse 1. Now, the tax collectors and sinners, the bad people, they were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes, they, these, are, these are the good, righteous, upstanding people in whom there is no flaw. <laughs> um, they, these, these people say, that they're grum it says that they grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So, basically what's happening here is to eat with someone is to welcome them into fellowship. It's in the Middle East, it's, it's kind of a, um, let's continue a, a relationship together. And so the Pharisees are saying, you are, you are associating with wicked, evil people. Not good. And then Jesus goes into this story called uh, the parable of the lost sheep. And we'll come back right back to that. But the thing that caught me off is that you have these two extremes. These people who think that they're good enough. These people who don't think that they're good enough. And the people who don't think that they're good enough, or maybe they did think that they were good, it doesn't matter. The, the sinners, the, the bad people, they, they were the ones who were listening to Jesus. And the people who thought that they were good enough, they weren't listening to Jesus. <laughs> in fact, they, were, they kept looking for opportunities to get him in trouble. Kept looking for opportunities to, to catch him in his, in his words. There's, there's a part in Luke, I forget exactly where it is, but it says they were looking for a way to trap him in his words. And uh, then in another part it says they were looking for how they might get rid of him because they were afraid of the crowds. And uh, so, you know, there, you got these people who are, oh, these are good people. And they're the ones who are trying to kill Jesus. And these, these bad people, they're the ones who are trying to listen. And so, okay, let, let's, let's kind of put some pieces together, okay? So in the Pharisees' mind, they're probably thinking something along the lines of this. He's condoning sin. 
by hanging out with these sinners, he is telling them it's okay to live like that. It's okay to live in sin. It's okay to just do whatever you want, and, 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 and he's correcting them. But then on their side, they are extremely, extremely self-righteous. They follow the rules. They earn God's favor. They, they're, they're good enough. You know, they're, they're just good enough to be saved. They don't need Jesus' help. And uh, they're, they're concerned that Jesus is, go, is going to the opposite extreme from them because they're the extreme righteous. You, no one is more righteous than me. And then Jesus is, is he's, he's helping these other, these other extreme wickedly people. And he's helping them to, to have an excuse to live however they want. You know, um, he's, he's, he, they're, they're going to have this idea, Jesus, you don't understand. They're going to have the idea that they can live however they want. That it doesn't matter. And the funny thing about this is that Jesus completely understands the situation. He, under, he understands the complexity of it. Some people, when you, when you show them mercy, they will continue to live in just wickedness. And then on the, on the flip side of that, other people will forget where they came from and think that somehow they are better than someone else. But Jesus, in seeing the complexity of the situation, he doesn't try to validate himself. He doesn't try to prove himself right. He doesn't try to justify himself. He doesn't try to prove his ministry. Because he wasn't insecure. He knew what he was there for. He saw people in need, and he went forward. Instead, he explains with a parable to show these self-righteous people what's actually going on. Jesus wasn't condoning any sin. And, and, and that's something that, that this two extremes, he was, you'll find that oftentimes in life, people will try to rope you into an extreme. You either have to do this view or this view, there's nowhere in between. And here we have Jesus yet again, not being drawn into the conflict. He's not picking sides. He's teaching, trying to teach the Pharisees what he's doing, but he's also trying to love and serve the sinners. He's trying to reach both people. Because they were both sinners, they were just sinners in different ways. See, the, 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 the um, what are they called, the tax collectors and, and the sinners, everybody knew that they were wrong. They, they're, they're, they're sin, but nobody understood that the, that the Pharisees were wrong. They were guilty of a different sin. Their sin was pride. Their sin was arrogance. Their sin was that they didn't love. So Jesus, in not being insecure, doesn't try to, to, to pick sides in this controversy that's been going on long before Jesus uh, came to the earth as, as, a, as a person. And he had this whole different mindset of loving both groups. Imagine that. And that's just so, I think, in my opinion at least, is that that's just so groundbreaking because we are told constantly that one side is inherently evil, the other side is inherently good, you have to pick the right side, you have to agree with them wholeheartedly, they can't ever mess up, everything has to be perfect, and if you don't take the wrong side, you yourself are condoning evil. There's this, there's this massive either-or, black and white, uh, clearly defined line, and if you're not a part, if you're not on the rock, right side of that line, it's just you see what I mean? And this is exactly the same thing the Pharisees are trying to do. They're trying to suck Jesus into this either-or extremist thing. And Jesus is just trying, at the same time that he's trying to reach out to these sinners, he, he takes time to explain to these Pharisees about the, this parable. And, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So Jesus was not a part of either faction. And then to emphasize this, he tells the story of looking for the lost sheep so as to restore it. Okay, so there's this guy... He, he has a hundred sheep. He loses one. That's not that's not that big of a loss, right? I I, I have the other ninety nine, but instead of making sure that that other ninety nine stays safe, you know, because make sure it's all about it's all about uh, it's all about um, quantity. Make sure that you keep those ninety nine safe. You know, you have to protect them from the outside. No, that's not what happens at all. He leaves the ninety nine to go find the one missing. And this is right after the Pharisees say, oh, he's, con you, you, you don't get it, Jesus. These people are evil. Left the 99 to find the one lost sheep. These are the lost sheep. And guess what, Pharisees? You are the lost sheep. See, Jesus is teaching them that these sinners that they're looking down on, that, that, that they are worth going after, that, that, that he loves them. 
And then he's also implying you, by thinking that you were found, are actually one of the lost sheep. And he goes into this in another part of the Gospels. And so he's, he's not ostracizing either people like, oh, we have this idea that, oh, Jesus hates the Pharisees. Jesus hates self-righteous people. Jesus hates religious people that just can't, can't love people. That's just not Jesus. That's not Jesus. So Jesus did want to save the lost and desperate. This was obviously something that he was all about. So on the side of the Pharisees, the whole legalistic side of, of you have to be perfect, right? There's this. Jesus takes us wherever we are, right? He takes us where we're at. When we're a mess, that's where that he, he saves us there. He doesn't expect us to get better for us to save for us for him to save us. But at the same time, he doesn't just leave us there. Oh, I found you as a mess, so I'm gonna leave you as a mess. That that doesn't make some better than others, that makes some further on a different journey than others. See what I mean? When you look at someone else, don't see them as, oh, that person's a lost cause, or oh, that person's a screw up, or oh, that person is super righteous. It's Jesus that makes us righteous, not our goodness. Other people are just on different parts of a journey. Not everyone will make it to the desired destination, but ultimately we don't know who will and who won't. So Jesus did have a plan. Are we allowing him to work in us, or are we opposing him and giving, give and living however we want? That's that's kind of the on the side of the extremists. So yes, and, and the Pharisees. So yes, the Pharisees were right in that aspect. God did want to change sinful people, restore them to God. Okay, okay, bring these people to God. That's fine. But on the flip side of that, so addressing the more the, the sinners in the crowd, Jesus went to where people were. He didn't expect people to get there on their own. He, he doesn't want us to go to either of those extremes. So he does want to change us, but he also loves us where we are. See, see the difference there? And the Pharisees didn't understand this. They thought that there was either or. Jesus, either you only hang out with the people who are good enough like us, or you hang out with them and you condone their evil behavior. They, they didn't get that. So we are not to live as, as lawless, as though we, we, we can just live however we want. But we are also not to live as legalistic. Oh, I'm good enough. I'm perfect. The Pharisees didn't get that. They thought it was either or. And they thought that they were right. And everybody else was obviously wrong. Duh. Anybody who disagrees with me is wrong. Jesus' attitude, however, was to love and serve the undesirable, the weak, the failures, the self-righteous, everyone. So we're either okay with reaching out to help druggies or with pacifying good people. But a lot of times we're one or the other. We're not okay with both. You, you'll see pastors a lot of times, unfortunately, focus on our mission is the lost. And then they completely ignore Christians who are in need. And then other pastors, you see them go to another extreme of saying, okay, I have to protect my flock from those out there. I have to keep them safe from the corruption of the world. It, my job is not to is not to win the lost. That's that's just completely God's job. I don't have to reach out to those people, those sinners. No, I don't have to worry about them. I just have to stay here and and keep my flock safe. But Jesus didn't have that attitude. He had this. How about both? How about I love and serve the undesirable, the weak, the failures, and the self-righteous? Many people leave the church, unfortunately, because they want to be a part of a club. They want to be treated better than Jesus himself was. They want everything to be just right. My style of music, my style of dress code, my style of everything. It has to be exactly like this, and this is the only way to do it. And, you know, then they blur the line of, of, of what's even our purpose as a church is existing. They just want to be a part of a club. They want to have recognition. They want to have social status. They want to look at me. Look how much I contributed. This is my pew. It, I paid for it myself. This is where I sit. They don't want to sacrifice themselves, but they want people to bend over backwards to cater to them. Oh, that offends me. Oh, that offends me. Oh, that offends me. It's not about, well, are you offending somebody who could be saved by demanding that you are served more than the Lord himself? But then many other people don't want to come to church 
because they feel like they aren't welcome. Gee, I wonder why. They aren't good enough. They aren't whatever. They have a hard time accepting God's grace, and a lot of times they have a hard time accepting God's grace because we as believers, as Christians, don't show them God's grace. We expect them to come in knowing all the rules and following them as good and faithful as we do. Surely you see the sarcasm dripping from my voice. I hope. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> um, see, the, the Pharisees in Luke chapter 15, they, they were not helping the problem. The problem of these sinners aren't having a hard time accepting God's grace. What can I do to show them God's grace, to help them to see that they are welcome here? The Pharisees weren't helping that problem. They, they in fact, were driving a wedge. You were causing more of a problem. And then when Jesus tried to fix the problem, then they got even madder. Jesus, we've been trying to segregate these people so that they'd feel stupid and dumb and, and, and worthless so that they would change their ways. What are you doing? You're going to make them think that they don't have to change their ways, that we have to love them without getting anything in return. What are you doing, Jesus? You're messing up our whole system. Christianity is not about loving... I'm sorry, Christianity... I said that backwards. Christianity is about loving and serving. It's not about living however we want, nor is it making sure that others live how we want them to live. See, those are the two pitfalls people who profess Christianity fall into a lot of the times. First off, they live in sin and they say, it's okay, I can live however I want. Only God judges me. So that means I can, I can disobey God and the rules that he has put into place because, you know, I just have this special relationship with Jesus. But then on the other side, a lot of times we, we go to that, to that place and said, everybody else has to live how I want them to live. I'm the boss. If it offends me, then it's wrong. Well, what if you're just easily offended? Genuine question, I guess. So we have to, each of us, let God change our own hearts. When you're reading the Bible and you're constantly seeing, well, they need this. When you go to a service and you constantly say, well, if only that person had been there. When you go to prayer and your only prayer is, God, I pray that you do, 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 for, do. You see what I mean? Like, it, it, there comes a point when it's like, are you a watchdog? Or are you God's servant sent to love and serve even as Jesus himself loved and served? See, Jesus loved to the point of death, literally. And he doesn't expect us to love any less than that. See, he showed us. He showed us. So we have to, each of us, let God change our own hearts. And we are all sinners. But the thing is, we all commit different crimes. Some of us say, I'm good enough. And that's your sin. You're not depending on God giving you grace, God giving you mercy. You think you've achieved it already. Then other people live in sin, and that's that's your sin, the obvious sins, like in Luke chapter 15. Oh, they were tax collectors and sinners. Don't pay them any mind. Everybody already knows that sin. What about the closet sins? What about the things like pornography? What about things that, that nobody ever knows about? What about when you beat your, beat your spouse or, or your children and then you cover it up with makeup and hope nobody ever finds out. Oh, well, it's okay. We're still, we're still good people. Or maybe you go to the other extreme. I'm too bad for God to save me. What happens when you refuse to love and serve just like the Pharisees did? Well, you become bitter. You gossip and complain. You, you don't make a difference in the world, that's for sure. And by doing these things, you will also... It, 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 it's it's both, both ways. When you refuse to love and serve people, you become bitter and gossip and complain. When you become bitter and gossip and complain, you refuse to love and serve people. It, it goes both ways. So what happens when you refuse to change? Like, hopefully none of the sinners and tax collectors did. Hopefully they didn't do this. But hypothetically, let's say that they said, Oh, that was interesting. Now let's go on and proceed with my life. Excuse me. So what happens if you refuse to change? Well, God, you found me here so I can continue to live like this. Unfortunately, what happens is you wander through struggle after struggle and, and you never move on. You never grow. You never know that peace. Now, I don't know where the line is of not being saved. I don't know. Luckily, I don't have to know. 
But I do know that it causes a lot of problems that you wouldn't have had either any uh, other ways. And I do know that it puts a barrier between you and other people getting to know God. So I, I hope that this is something for you to for you to think about. Don't don't see yourself as I am without flaw. God is lucky to have me. And any church that I decide to bless by going to is lucky to have me. But then on the other side, don't go to the other extreme and say, I'm just I'm just too rotten. God can never I mean come on. Come on. So have a great uh, great rest of the day, guys, and I uh, hope to see you on service Sunday. I think that's it. If it's not it, pretend like I said something super profound at the end of this video, okay?